Hello and welcome to the Katie Halper Show. We are so excited to be joining you, to be joined by you. We have a great show. It's packed to the brim. We have not one amazing guest, but two amazing guests. They are Susan Abulhawa and Aaron Good. And we are so excited to be talking to them about very interesting topics that are different but interrelated. But before we do that, let me just make sure to welcome you, to invite you all to, of course, like this stream. It's a way that you help support the show. It's a way that you help uh, fight back against the algorithm. There's a lot of suppression on YouTube as well as on social media outlets uh, and social media in general. So we really appreciate everything that you can do to help spread the word about the show because we bring you really important voices like Aaron's and Susan's, as you'll see today. So to do that, you just press the thumbs up. Another way to support the show is subscribe. We want to get to 100K subscribers. We're at 85, almost at 86, so we got to get those numbers up. Uh, you can also become YouTube members. You can also become Patreon supporters at patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. Again, that's patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. For $1 a month, you get to make the show happen. Uh, you get to sleep well at night knowing that you do that for $5 a month. You get ex exclusive content, uh, extended interviews, really great gems, sometimes longer interviews, sometimes uh, just separate interviews. For instance, this week, one of the Patreon-only episodes is a chat that I have with Brianna Joy Gray about Joe Rogan and his comments about Ilhan Omar, which were less than helpful in her struggle to uh, dismiss the absolute smears against her that claim she's an anti-Semite, which she is not. I've defended her. Uh, Joe Rogan tried to and did not do a very good job during a conversation he had with Chris Sabal. So Brianna Joy Gray and I chat about that in a Patreon-only exclusive video. Um, you also will see the full chat that I have with Aaron Good if you're Patreon, Patreon subscribers. If you're watching live, you get to see the full thing. But if you're watching this later and you want to see the full chat with Aaron, again, patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. No one's making uh, a lot of bank off of this. This is not about getting rich. This is just so we can uh, put money into the show to make it as good as it can be for you. Also, uh, after the show, we're going to be doing a call-in. Uh, that's where uh, it's a free app. You just download it on your phone if you don't already have it. And we take your calls and questions. I'll be joined by both Aaron and Susan, so you'll be able to ask them your questions. And that's very exciting. Um, so I'm going to bring on our first guest. Uh, and the link to the call-in is in, this, in the description. Okay, so uh, Susan Abuhawa is a Palestinian-American writer and human rights activist. She's the author of Mornings in Janine. The Blue Between Sky and Water, and Against the Loveless World. She's the founder of Playgrounds for Palestine and the executive director of Palestine Rights. She's also the winner of several awards, including the Lee Way Foundation and Nandrade Award for Fiction and Creative Nonfiction, Best Books Award for Historic Fiction, Memo Palestine Book Award, and we'd be here all day if I kept reading them. So I'm just going to bring her onto the show. Susan, welcome. Hi, Katie. Thanks for having me. Of course. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you. I wanted to ask you, first of all, thank you for coming. And I'm a big fan of your books. And so it's very exciting for me to be interviewing you. Um, and I highly suggest everyone read all, th all three of the, the novels that you've written. And Mornings in Janine is especially relevant right now uh, sat for, for very unfortunate reasons. But I think it's a really great way for people to um get a sense of of the life in Janine and uh I want to just thank you for for writing that book and the other books that you've written well thanks Katie I appreciate that yeah. can you share with uh viewers and listeners your relationship to Palestine and your family's relationship to Palestine well I mean I'm I'm Palestinian um <clears throat> we're indigenous to the place um we my family goes back hundreds of years and um, a town called Atur, which is in East Jerusalem. And prior to that, uh, we hailed from a village called Deir el Hawa, which is my namesake, uh, which is in West Jerusalem. So at some point, um, I think in the 15th century, one of my ancestors sort of made the big, a long trek, left left our ancestral village in Deir el Hawa and then went to a new village. And um, so most of us, um, 
have been expelled. Um, I still have some cousins who still live uh, in in Palestine. Um, there's a big, you know, it's it's a huge sprawling family on, on the Mount of Olives. Um, but my immediate family have all been um, were, were exiled. My my grandmothers died as refugees, and um, here we are. And where did your family go? All over, like most Palestinians. I mean, pa families were were scattered. Um, seeking sustenance in different places. Uh, my parents initially went to Jordan and then they went to Kuwait, which is where I was born eventually. And um, yeah, but I mean, you know, some of us uh, are in Jordan, some are in Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, other parts of the Gulf, um, Lebanon. And have you been able to go to Palestine? Well, um, I lived in Palestine when I was younger and um, when I turned 13, uh, I was, uh, Israel expelled me for, you know, being an infiltrator because I didn't have documentation, um, ironically. <clears throat> and uh, I, sorry, just so people, I meant go back, but I, but definitely tell the story from, from where you just started. And, um, and then I went back uh, as an American citizen many years later, and I was going back every year. Um, with a, an organization that I founded to build playgrounds in Palestine. We, you know, I went there every year to build playgrounds and visit family and, you know, just be in, be in my, um, in my homeland. Uh, but in 2015, I think it was, um, I was banned from entering and I haven't been able to go back since. Oh. And um, have they told you why? Um, I've never been told why. Uh, the second time I was uh, not allowed in, Gedeon Levy, he's a, an Israeli reporter for Haaretz, uh, wrote an article about it. And I think he called the, the interior ministry to, to inquire why. And he was told, according to the article that he wrote, that I was rude to my interrogator um, in 2015. And yeah, that, I mean, that's literally the reason that they told me. I mean, after I... seven hours of interrogation, I was rude to her. And therefore, um, I mean, that was, you know, and he even says, as far as I know, that's not illegal. <laughs> yeah. I also, okay, I don't want to get, I'm saying this, not you, but Israelis, and I have, I have cousins there. They're not, being rude in Israel is not very atypical. That's all I'm going to say. I don't think I'm sure you weren't rude or if you were rude, it was justifiable. But it's kind of rich for Israelis to kick people out of anywhere for being rude. Well, I, I think it highlights the um, arbitrariness of yeah. their rule over Palestinians, not just, you know, Palestinians um, who are literally under their thumb, but anybody who, like, you know, including American citizens of Palestinian ancestry. It is. Um, uh, you know, you are no matter who you are, you're at you're at the mercy of some young, you know, gun toting soldier. And um, uh, and, and that's that's pervasive. Right. Yeah. And you're right. So even your American citizenship privilege doesn't protect right. you from that, which is, of course, a theme that you deal with in um, Mornings in Janine. The character well, deals with. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, and so can you tell us about when you were kicked out for not having documentation? So I lived in a place called Dar al -Tifl. Um It's actually a, a pretty, um, it's, a, it's an orphanage, but it's a, a, a well-known institution in Jerusalem. And um, uh, I had gone in when I was 10 years old with my grandmother and Israel used to, this was back when, you know, before they closed off Jerusalem to the West Bank. And so one could travel easily between different parts of the West Bank and Jerusalem in the 80s. And um, I was stopped at one point. And, you know, if you're younger than 13, they would, they never, you know, they wouldn't ask you for, for documentation. But at 13 and above, if you didn't have papers, you had to, you had to, um, I don't know, face the consequences. And I mean, I was quite young at the time, so I don't remember a whole lot except that, you know, I was told that I had to, you know, my family uh, told me I had to leave. So 
And that was when I came to the U.S. Right. And you're kind of a Renaissance woman because you write uh, poetry, you write fiction, but you also started out as a scientist. So what uh, turned you into a writer? What made you become a writer from a scientist? Um, in part, it was Janine. Um, and I think I was probably always a writer. Um, I used to write when I was much younger. I used to write um, Arabic poetry because uh, Arabic was the first language I learned to read and write. I didn't learn to read and write English actually until I was 13 when I, after I came here and, um, and now, you know, my Arabic was arrested at that, at that younger yeah. stage and it never developed. But, um, I went to medical school because, you know, every Arab family thinks you need to be, I saw, like it's the only legitimate profession is a doctor or, or maybe an engineer or something. Right. So, you know, I had to prove something that, you know, to prove I was smart or something smarter than the boys. So I was going to go to medical school and be a doctora. <laughs> um, but I, I worked in medical research, um, um, pharmaceutical research for a while. And then when the second intifada happened, I started just writing, start out as letters to the editor and then op-eds. And I was surprised that editors were asking me to, you know, to submit more things. And um, I actually didn't realize I could even, <laughs> I could write. <laughs> and, and then when Janine happened, when uh, the massacre in Janine um, was happening and they weren't calling it that, I was, I knew there was more to it. And so I took my um, little two week vacation and I went there and, and uh, it was, it was a, it was a life altering experience to be so close to that kind of um, intense cruelty and death and um, the smell of it. And the, just the, um, the profound inhumanity uh, really up close. And I think it's, you know, reading about it in books, it has never captured, you know, as, as a Palestinian, I've never, you know, I'm not a stranger to gory photos, whether it's from, you know, Sabran Shatila or, or, you know, the news or the first Intifada. I mean, we, I'd always seen those terrible images, but it was a completely different experience to, um, to, you know, to be surrounded by it and to speak to people and to, um, and to be embraced by, um, by people who had literally nothing left in the world except, you know, their, their, their loved ones. And, um, it was, it was profoundly moving and, um, and life changing. And I, when I came back, um, I just, you know, I was, I really felt completely out of, out of place in working for a corporation. And, and luckily, although I didn't realize it at the time, I was laid off not much longer mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was in part because of the things that I was writing, right. by the way. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know that <laughs> well, <Right. laughs> getting, getting canceled. <laughs> this was before cancel culture was even a thing. Um, I got trailblazer. Yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, that, well, women have been canceled for way longer right. for many things for a long time, but, um, yeah. And I, you know, as a single mom, I wasn't making much money. And, um, but I, and so the only thing, you know, I was terrified not having an income and not having savings. So I, the only thing I could think to do was to sit down and write about what I had witnessed. And, and at some point I realized it was a novel and yeah. Wow. That's great. Um, so glad that it worked out and yeah, me you too. Were able to give the world these great books. Yeah. Um, you're one of the things I love to love about Mornings and Janine is that it really is historical fiction and it's also kind of incorporates journalism and um, you cite writings from Noam Chomsky and the late Robert Fisk and Norman Finkelstein. Um, did you go into that knowing you wanted to incorporate those kinds of texts or did it just come from your writing? No, I don't really know much about um, the stories I write until I mm. sit down to write them. Um, a lot of my 
writer friends do outlines and and really sort of have a, a full picture of the story before they write and that's just not my process um mm. i you know i had a few seed things that i started with but everything sort of unfolded in the process of writing and rewriting and rewriting and how uh autobiographical is mornings in janine um so none of my books are um, autobiographical, but I do insert some autobiographical elements. I mean, I, so what I mean is that I, none of the characters are me. A lot of people want to know if, you know, if that, if the, if Amal or any of the other right. characters are based on my, myself and the answer is uh, an emphatic no. But in Mornings in Janine, I, I did put, um, I mean, if you recall, there's a chapter called The Orphanage and that's actually right. Um, that's my life. That was a lot of that was true from my life uh, living in that Jerusalem orphanage for three years. And then um, Amal is also in Philadelphia and working as right. a medical writer. So, you know, I did incorporate some th things that I knew. I think it's important to, um, to, to kind of know viscerally what you're talking about when, when you write. I mean, I, research is important and it's necessary. And I, and I do a lot of research for all my books, but I, but when I'm writing about a place, I like to have been there and to have walked the streets and to have smelled the smells and, and heard the sounds. And um, so uh, for her to be in, in Philadelphia, that was just kind of a convenient yeah. thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And of course the main character in um, your latest book uh, is in Kuwait, which is where you also lived. Exactly. Um, and that's a, fa that's a fascinating book as well, novel. And you have a character, the main character is a sex worker. I, I want to know what made you uh, decide to have that as a part of her character. Um, so sex work is actually, is, is really, um, it's it's like it is everywhere in the world you know it's it's um it's pervasive and it's this big open secret that nobody's allowed to talk about and as a writer you know tell me not to talk about something <laughs> that's exactly what i'm right. going to talk about but i think you know i i write i mean my my main audience are 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 arabs and other palestinians and i um, so this is, you know, it's, it's an internal kind of dialogue in a lot of ways. It's, a, this is a, this is a life lived. Um, this character, uh, went through a lot of things and, um, you know, it's, it's kind of an honor to be able to pull this together and put this in, in, in our sort of collective literary landscape. Um, I also was really interested in the ways that, marginalized people will marginalize members of their own society. Mm -hmm. And of course, sex workers are certainly marginalized. Um, and I wanted to take that person and explore her life, her humanity, her value, and then put her in one of the most exalted positions in our society, which is um, one of a freedom fighter. Right. So um, that was a really interesting process for me as a writer and it was challenging. So that was, um, that was the thought process behind that. And what are your thoughts on what's happening now in Israel? Uh, there's a lot of discussion of the, of the erosion of democracy as if up until this election, Israel's democracy were, had been thriving. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah. I mean, I don't really, I don't care about Israel. I just, you know, I just don't. And, and, and I don't care to participate in discussions about the sham of a democracy. It's not, it's, you know, it's a democracy as much as this country was a democracy during slavery or, you know, as much as South Africa was a democracy during the height of apartheid. So not. <clears throat> exactly. I mean, it's a big, it's a big fairy tale and it's a big sham that they, um, push on the world. And I just, um, I really just don't care to, to even give it, you know, the value of, <laughs> of even, even a discussion. 
Um, I also call that land Palestine. Um, mm. It is always going to be Palestine to me, um, including the 48 borders. I, I consider them colonizers. Um, and uh, yeah. And what else do you think people need to know about what's happening in Palestine, in Janine? Um, something I keep encountering and I honestly, I know it's not true and I'm tr struggling with the best way to respond to it, but I, I'll post something on Twitter about uh, Palestinians being killed and people will say, oh, but they were terrorists. And, and some of these people are people who are not raging idiots. How do you deal with this problem of the, of the combination, the range from ignorance to just bigotry and racism? Um, so again, you know, I don't really communicate with, <laughs> right. with people them. who think like that. Yeah. Yeah. I just don't, I mean, they're just not worth my time. I mean, I, they, they're just, I'm, it's, you know, my, um, I don't see my role as, you know, somebody who's, who should be going to battle or go or mm -hmm. trying to educate, um, people who are just sometimes, frankly, just irredeemably, sure. um, racist. And I don't, I mean, I, I, you know, my time is better spent in dialogue with other Palestinians, with empowering our community, with, um, uplifting our community and, uh, and, and fighting for, for liberation. So, um, you know, that said, um, I'm not, I don't always sort of adhere to my own lofty ideals and right. I do get sucked into, you know, these idiots and occasionally I will respond. And then I just have to remind myself like, God, what are you doing? You know, right. um, because it is easy to get sucked in. <clears throat> I think, um, this is a very old script. You know, it's a very old colonial script. You go in, you terrorize people, you say that God loves you the most and, and you're doing this because God God is on your side and these people are savages or they're terrorists or they're backward or whatever, whatever the, the description of the day is. And, um, and then you kill them. You kill them all. And then when they fight back and they always will fight back because they're human beings and, and you, and colonizers always underestimate um, indigenous people, then, you know, um, then, then, you know, you sort of, you, you you're the instigators. An excuse. You have an excuse. You say, Oh, well, look what they did. I mean, you know, when, when native Americans would, on the occasions when they did fight back against white settlers who would, you know, do the unspeakable to, to them, to whole, to whole tribes and whole towns. And, um, and when they fought back, they were brutal, you know, when they managed to, to, uh, uh, to do something. And, um, and then that where they were like, see, look how savage right. they are. They killed these women and children. Meanwhile, you know, whole families and communities of native Americans have been wiped out. Um, and that's all that's invisible until the white people got killed. And it's the same thing in this instance. This is another instance of settler colonialism and, and the, the, the extraordinary intense and persistent daily terrorism and violence and humiliation that, that is heaped upon Palestinians is completely ignored until we fight back. And, and when we kill an Israeli, um, it's, you know, suddenly the world lights up in the media and, in, and then you get these buzzwords about the cycle of violence and, and the brutality. And then, of course, you know, the magic word terrorists and, and it's thrown around and then voila, that's how you kill every Palestinian. That's how, you know, and, it, and it's just, it's, it's, it's incredible. And like you said, you know, otherwise, you know, intelligent people, um, <laughs> Although I'm not sure that you can really call sure. somebody intelligent when they, when, you know, when they sort of buy into this. Um, but it is remarkable to see how um, how Israel has managed to have such a grip on public imagination through mainstream media. Right. 
which is why I think that there are people who would otherwise like, I mean, we could have a whole debate on how intelligent you have to be. But I do think that what's scary is that given that people learn about things through the media, when you don't know what they're misrepresenting, I mean, certain things, obviously, like certain bigotry is just has nothing to do with information and it's inexcusable. And uh, but then there are other people who I think because our mainstream media is so biased, uh, it's almost hard to realize that what you're hearing is actually not objective reporting, yeah. but ideological. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so the problem is at the very foundation, Americans believe that we have this thing called a free press. Right. And so they, so they operate from that assumption and don't really question very much. I mean, they, there's this assumption that, oh, yeah, well, you know, maybe Fox is a little bit right leaning and maybe CNN is a little bit left leaning, but, you know, they balance each other. There's this, it, it's, it's really kind of, um, and I understand how, how it can happen, um, but, it's, but it's unfortunate. And, and most people have no idea the, how, the, the amount of spin and, um, and messaging and corporate control over, um, over what they get to see and how many individual gatekeepers there right. are to knowledge, to public knowledge and public information. And even, you know, when, I mean, I'm old enough to remember when the internet became, you know, was, became the internet. Um, there was a lot of hope that, you know, wow, there's this, you know, and for, and for a couple of decades, that was true. I mean, people had um, free access to information, but now, I mean, these algorithms and the, right. the, the control, there's corporate control, even on, on, on the internet. And, right. You know, you can search Google f for for things you know are real and happened. You can't find them. Right. You know, yeah. unless you go to like, you know, page, you know, 5,600 or something and then <laughs> yeah, on the Google search. Yeah. And then there are all these just subtle ways like they'll the media will refer to clashes. Yeah. Oh, as, as if, you know, it's just two two or like, oh, you know, this is a uh, two sides. They can, they've always, this other trope is they've always been like this. They can't get along. What's new? Uh, they're bad people on both sides. I mean, it's a totally uh, a historical analysis uh, of the of the power dynamics, which just yeah. don't exist. In and it's purposeful. Analysis. It's right. purposeful obfuscation. I mean, those those are just some of the the buzzwords that you mentioned. But if, you know, there's others like the cycle of violence and right. it's a complex situation. Yeah, yeah. Or you don't live there, so you don't know. That's another yeah. one. And, um, and yeah, exactly. The both sidism arguments. Um, and then, you know, there's, there's other, there's so many ways that they manipulate people's thoughts in the way articles are written. So for example, you know, when Palestinians are killed, when Palestinians are murdered, actually, by Israeli soldiers, what they'll say is, you know, two Palestinians die in clashes. You know, right. like they just they just, you know, these these young men just dropped down and died. Yeah. They don't ever tell you how they died, who killed them, etc. But when a Palestinian fights back, it's very clear. Palestinian gunman murders, right. you know, seven Israelis in a synagogue, which was a lie, by the way. They were not in a synagogue. Right. Um, but, you know, it's there's uh, there's no equivocating when it comes to um, describing what Palestinians do. Um, but there's always obfuscation and, and high and, you know, just tempering the Israeli violence and brutality, which is far greater. Right. Um, yeah, there's a, I'm, I'm, tr I can't remember it exactly, but I'll have to find it and I'll add a link to it. But there was one thing where it was like Israeli, something so absurd. It was almost like Israeli missile finds home in beach in Gaza. Yeah, right. <laughs> it was like, I, you really can't, oh, missile at beachside Gaza cafe finds patrons poised for world cup. Yeah, that's what it yeah, is. Like, like this missile knocked on the door and said, hi. Yeah. 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 Instead of this missile blows people to pieces who yeah. are watching the World Cup. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's insane. Um, in yeah. Fact, the, 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 gym, the linguistic gymnastics are astounding. 
And the sad thing is that the American public is not, um, the, we're just not primed for critical thinking. Like you can see that and, and, and understand as a journalist, like what? But most Americans don't, you know, they don't think about that. Right. They don't have the critical thinking. Yeah, system. because you don't know the reality that's being yeah. distorted. You just see the distortion. Yeah, yeah well, that's why media analysis is so, I mean, media yeah. analysis is so hard. This is, by the way, the, the thing I was talking about. Missile at Beachside Gaza Cafe finds patron poised for World Cup. That's, yeah. Well, of course, that's the New York Times. Right. Which is, you know the chief whatever yeah <laughs> Cheerle cheerleader yeah or the idf they really are i mean it's it's grotesque yeah that this is the you know the paper of record and so tell us about i mean the ways that you are up uplifting palestine as you said um tell us about uh playgrounds for palestine and also the palestine rights festival um so I, I wouldn't say that I'm uplifting Palestine. That's, that's you know, I don't. Uh, I think you said Palestinians. Maybe that's, um, or maybe that I, was a comment. Sorry, I put words in yeah, your mouth. I do what I do what I, um, that's the, that's my focus anyway. I was yeah. just trying to make the point that I don't, um, I'm, my time is better spent with Palestinians, with my yes. own people than um, worrying about Israelis. But I, so Palestine rights is something that I started, um, I think it's been like 22 years now, or 23 years. Um, uh, it was a, it's a simple project. We're still an all volunteer um, group of people. We raise money uh, by selling Palestinian olive oil here in the U.S. We have our own label. It's called IDA. You can see it on our website. And um, and then whatever we collect, we use to fund the construction of playgrounds. It's a very simple com concept, um, which ends up being like really complicated <laughs> it's just because doing anything in palestine is uh. super complicated like we couldn't we can't just order equipment like normal people and then just install it because we can't do that uh, because israel makes our life hell um and so we have to go through all kinds of you know each time is different <laughs> let's just say that but we do build playgrounds and and they're they mean a lot to the children that get to use them um, and in a lot of ways, it's a band aid, you know. I'm not gonna lie, it is, but um, people deserve band aids though, exactly. Um, but for a lot of kids, it's uh, it's it's a whole new world. Um, the uh, Palestine Rights Literature Festival is um, this will be the second iteration, it's gonna happen in September uh, of this coming year. Um, it is the only North American literature festival that is dedicated to celebrating and promoting Palestinian literature and Palestinian cultural productions. It was uh, the the impetus for this festival was really born from the uh, pervasive exclusion and tokenization of Palestinian voices in mainstream literary and other cultural institutions in this country. And so it's, um, we, you know, we wanted to create a space that is for us and it's by us and it's with our friends. Um, most of the speakers are Palestinians and we, um, we bring them from all parts of our, our nation, from the 48 territories, from Jerusalem, from Lebanon, the West Bank, from Gaza, uh, and from our diaspora in the Arab world and in the U.S., and um, and there are some, there are non-Palestinian speakers as well, uh, all of whom are you know uh, have good politics. <laughs> and Alan Dershowitz. Yeah, no, he's not coming. Sure. <laughs> um, and yeah, we I mean we we talk about books, we talk about. Uh, the world. We talk about climate change, uh, feminism, um, uh, gender issues, um, queerness. Uh, you know, we, there's workshops uh, on on 
uh, all kinds of things on how to write, how to get published, um, how to do a depth kit. There's uh, there's depth kit, there's performances, there's music, there's great food. Um, there's all day children's programming, um, story time. So it's, it's a oh, really, great. yeah, it's a really cool thing. And, and um, we're really proud of it. It's, it's a lot of work. <laughs> Uh, and we're we're in the process now of you know we're still raising money. We have we have some really cool people lined up, a couple of really big names that I'm excited about, but we haven't announced yet. So okay, I say anything. Um, Where yeah, is it going to be? It's gonna be, oh yeah, it's, thank you for asking. It's gonna be in Philadelphia at, on the University of um, the University of Pennsylvania oh, campus. Nice. Yeah, I hope you come, Katie. Yeah, nice to have you. Yeah, I'd love to come. I'll, I'll get the dates and put in my calendar. Um, 22nd and, to the 24th September. Okay. 22nd, 24th. Great. Um, uh, and what else are you working on? Are you working uh, on a new novel or poetry? Yeah, um, or Oh, I you am, are? Great. What can you tell us about it? You know what? Here it is. Oh, wow. <laughs> I just got some pages from my editor that I sent to her. So she sent me, she sent them back. That's what I have on my desk. Um, yeah, I'm excited about it. I unfortunately had to put it aside and I haven't touched it in months because of, you know, working for the festival, which is just consuming my time at the moment. But I hope this will be done in, um, you know, a few months, maybe it, hopefully it'll come out in 2024, I hope, or 2025. I'm not sure. And what's it about? Can you tell us anything about it? Um, I can tell you that it involves uh, a woman from one of the camps in Lebanon who um, makes her way back to Palestine on foot. Wow. Across the border with her donkey. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm excited to read it. And I want to know your thoughts. Um, have you seen the movie Farha? I have. I want to know your thoughts on it. Uh and actually, I will say this, um, Derin Salam, who the director is coming to Palestine, oh, right? Oh, great. Yeah. That's amazing. And uh, this is a, a Netflix film, by the way, just in case people don't know. It's uh, excellent. I'll let Susan, you can uh, describe it. But uh, it was, of course, uh, accused of being anti-Semitic, a smear that uh, Susan knows all too yeah. well, as do I. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm luckier. I get I usually get one degree. Uh, I get the self-loathing Jew. Yeah, I was gonna say self-hating. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, so Farha is um a, a a wonderful, relatively short film. Yeah. Uh, about one experience during the Nakba, and it's it was remarkable particularly because it's really the first time that we have seen our um, trauma, you know, sort of reflected in popular media. As a matter of fact, we don't get to see ourselves reflected in any human way in popular media, which is part of the, the reason for Palestine rights. So there is Mo, I don't know if you saw that yeah. series, it's literally the first time we've ever seen, you know, a Palestinian human being or reflected as a human, you know, seeing somebody in the fullness of their humanity and their lives and there's their silliness and, and, you know, uh, and, you know, bad decisions and all of that. It just happened in 2022. I mean, that's, I mean, that's how right. demonized and vilified we are in this society. And, um, and then, you know, and then on the heels of that, Farha came and it was such a moment for us. Like I, so many of us hesitated to watch it. I mean, I can't tell you how many of my friends um, were, you know, they wanted to watch it, but they just couldn't because it's, you know, the Nakba is still real and raw. And, um, and it's based it, on a true story also. It is absolutely. And, you know, the thing, and, but I did watch it because I... Um, I also had hesitation too. I was kind of bracing myself and I'll, I'll admit I had a couple of glasses of wine to first. Um, and it was, it was really beautifully done. Um, I, I didn't, there wasn't so much, there was, there was a lot left up to the imagination 
Um, and she didn't, which was why it was so masterful. She didn't have to show everything. And it was right. specifically told it, from that little girl's point of view who could only see out of that one little hole. Um, uh, um, is it okay to tell the story? I guess what it is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, so during the, the Nakba is when um, it was the process of when Israel sort of committed a series of massacres and pogroms to drive out Palestinians from their homes and their villages. And then they went in and they would raise the villages to prevent Palestinians from returning. They also robbed the villages and robbed the people leaving and, and just sort of took everything. And um, in this one particular village, the, um, the, the, the Israel is declared and these Israeli soldiers come into, um, they're, they're coming into the village and the, uh, the, uh, the father who was the muhtar of the village hides his daughter in, um, uh, in a machzan. Um, what, I don't know what the word is in English. It's this kind of on closet. It's a machzan. It's a, like a, a machzan is a like. A cellar? Is it a cellar? Yeah, yeah. It's like a food cellar where people. Pan yeah. Yeah. It's like a pantry. Yeah. yeah. And he locks her in there. Uh, and she just she sees what's happening outside just through this one little hole um, that she carves out. And she sees, you know, really terrible things. She sees this one whole family sort of killed and before her eyes. Um, and they don't, they don't really show it. And then you there was a baby that was born and you just hear the baby crying and um, and then it stops crying. But you don't see you know, you don't see anything. So there's a lot left to the imagination, but it was, um, it meant a lot to really, to, to see that, to, to see a story from this great trauma that we all, we all have stories of the Nakba. Every Palestinian has a, a, a hugely traumatic story. And it's really, no matter what divides us, whether, whether they're political divisions whether they are geographic or now linguistic or economic divisions uh, or religious divisions, we all sort of have this common wound that we share. Um, you know, in much in the same way, I guess it is for Jews, you know, no matter what the differences are, there is this sort of common um, uh, anguish that that is the Holocaust. The difference is that um, the Holocaust is, has been acknowledged. You know, right. there is there's no there's no equivocating about it. There are monuments and museums and um, uh, and memorials all over the world. And it's built into a lot of educate mainstream it's education. Curricula, curricula, right. Curriculum, right. And, yeah. and, it, and it's um, uh, you know of of every other people. I mean, it, it has probably the most stories told in film um, and. And, and other popular media outlets. And that, you know, that's part of the, the restitution and the healing that we've never had that. We've never had an acknowledgement. We've never had a moment to see ourselves reflected and in a way that is sympathetic. And so that's what Farha meant to us here. Um, it, it was huge. It's monumental. And it's such a small film. And you would think that, you know... How can one small thing do that? But it does because, and and when it when it does that, it makes you realize how um, how humiliated you have been as a people, and how you continue to be. To, that you are so happy and excited and thrilled to see this, to to be so happy to see Mo, and and feel like you know like you're gonna cry over this silly you know funny com comedy of a series um and when and and then you know you examine your own feelings about such a thing and you know and, and the only realization you can come to is that this is just this is the depth of our humiliation this is the depth of our exclusion this is how how demeaned we are in the society that um we're just going not. We're all going nuts on Twitter about it. Right. And why do you think there's been a shift in perception on this issue? Well, because you know, decades of work. 
decades of people working and and refusing to go away, refusing to be silent, refusing to um, uh, you know to to to, to cave into cancellation. People who will continue to write after they get fired or will, you know, will make their own shows when they get fired, <laughs> you know, hats off to you. Oh. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's uh, in the same way that, um, you know, there's there's a shift in everything. And I and I think um, it also. There's only so much. I mean, Israel has done a really extraordinary job at at hiding things and spinning things and obfuscating reality. But there's only so much they can do. You know, I mean, it's a really brutal society. And I like they've brutal they in in hating us so much and brutalizing us, they've actually destroyed their own lives. They've destroyed their soul. Like I I would hate to be an Israeli. I would hate to be part of that society, even though they have all the power and all the money and all the clout and um, and all the, the weapons. I would not want to be them because I think they've become a soulless, vacuous people. And that that happens when you, you know. When every member of your society is conscripted into brutalizing other people on the on a regular basis, that's a terrible thing. And, um, you know, I, I think victims have a better, um, are better at retaining their humanity than, than the victimizers. And I think, um, at some point you just can't hide that. Mm. But, um, any final thoughts that you want to share or any Palestinian writers or activists you want to, um, give shouts out to? Oh my gosh, there's so many. I am. Uh, I I will say that we are working with the, the team working on Palestine rights is amazing. Um, Susan Amadi Daraj is she's also a Palestinian writer is um, directing. She's the director of the publication arm. We're also publishing um, uh, an old Kenafani uh, biography that's been out of print. Um, so she's she's doing that. Hawei Daraf, whom you might. Uh, no, she was the co-founder of um, the International Solidarity Movement. She's a human rights attorney, is also part of it. Um, Ala, um, uh, Tala Al-Fahmawi, Lara Al-Bast. Um, yeah, we, we have a really, a, a really great crew. Great. Yeah. I'm excited. Thank you. Um, well, thank you so much. Everyone follow Susan. I'll put her Twitter in the description. Um, the, the website for uh, Palestine Rights is in the description already. And um, we'd love to have you back. Thank you, Katie. I appreciate you having me. Thanks. That was great. Uh, wow. Love, love that conversation and really highly recommend um, Susan's books. They're great. You enjoy them as novels and you get to learn about history and politics. Um, so we are going to bring in our next guest. Uh, we're going to play at the very end of this. I'm going to play a teaser of that Brianna Joy Gray uh, chat that I had, but we're going to just bring on our next guest. And I just want to remind people that if you haven't already done so, please do like this stream. Also, please subscribe. You can subscribe very easily by, uh, pressing uh, subscribe and then the bell. That way you don't miss any streams. So you won't miss great speakers like Susan and Aaron. Um, also, if you are watching live, you'll get to see this entire interview with Aaron that's coming up. If you're watching later and you want to see the full interview with Aaron, as well as a chat that I had with Brianna Joy Gray, uh, you can do that at patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. Again, that's patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. Also, remember right after the stream, we're doing a call in where we take your calls and your questions and your comments. And the link to that is also in um, YouTube. All right, so I'm about to bring on Aaron Good. He is a political scientist and historian, the host of American Exception podcast and the author of American Exception, Empire and the Deep State. Welcome, Aaron. Uh, thanks for having me on. Yeah, of course, thanks for coming. So wanted to ask you so many questions for you. And here's the book, American Exception. Um, wanted to ask you to start off, I guess, 
you talk about a word that gets thrown around a lot. Uh, and I want you to talk about what it means. And the word is hegemony. Because a lot of things that the United States does, people say, well, it's all about U.S. hegemony or uh, U.S. needs to be a hegemon. But what does that actually mean? Well, it's it's very similar to the idea of imperialism, except it's a little broader. If you say hegemony, it can actually apply to dominance over any particular realm. So you could say that, I don't know, Darwinian evolution is hegemonic in the field of biology, for example. Um, in the case of U.S. foreign policy and political science and international relations, which is a subdiscipline of political scientists, of science, political science, it means uh, the dominance over the globe, over the international system. And this is something that as an empire, you strive to achieve hegemony over your empire, over the area you're supposed to dominate. And so the U.S. pretty much picked this up from the British, uh, but they sort of supersized it when they became the, the global uh, hegemon after World War II. And this is, I, I think, been the defining feature of U.S. society is uh, this global hegemony, which has uh, really, I think, overridden all other uh, aspects of U.S. politics. And it's really it, it's been the driving force of U.S. history now is this drive for global dominance. And so it's something everybody should should be aware of and, and, and be thinking about if they care about politics. And when when the United States does something or the government does something or the deep state does something, and we'll get into that in a second. And they're doing it for the sake of hegemony. Does that mean political power, political dominance? Does that mean economic dominance? Is it a combination of those things? They are all related. When you control the economic system of a of, of a civilization, then you're going to control the apparatus that is supposed to secure that system and protect it. So under feudalism, you had the crown and it was legitimate legitimated by the church and they paid all the salaries of the sheriffs and other knights and so on because they controlled the whole economic system and where all the money and surplus of the economy went and so they could maintain themselves for a while that way and they controlled the culture that way uh you know the church was the responsible for the sense making of the time you know the earth was flat and it was at the center of the universe and the king was the king because the, uh, the because God wanted it that way. And if he if God didn't want it that way, then the king wouldn't be the king. This is kind of like the logic of hegemony. If you apply it, that's that logic to feudalism. Then it's, we can. It, it seems very clear, and it, it becomes kind of ridiculous to think to endow or to invest any of those institutions with like you know uh, legitimacy or divine sanction or whatever. When we think about our own times, we, we typically think about it differently because we sort of trust, we believe in things like the free press, okay? But the myth of the free press uh, is kind of like the, the divine right of kings. It's just something that it, it falls apart if you scrutinize it at all, but it's like, this is one of the things that we think of as uh, explaining how our civilization works. So yeah, hegemony in all these areas, culture, cultural, economic, uh, intellectual, educational, <laughs> Uh, these are these are all inter interrelated, and I think that in the U.S. case, this international hegemony over the global political economy is what underpins the uh, all of the other ways that they control, you know, perceptions around the world and everything else. Uh, this is the, so every it's all it's all it really is all related. I mean, this is a, a kind of a generic materialist perspective, but uh, I think it's it's pretty hard to argue with uh, when it comes down to it. So how does this apply in the real world? Like, let's talk about what's happening now in Russia. Um, the United States is doing what it's doing. So for someone like me, and I think like you and a lot of my viewers, right? Uh, the United States did, did not do all of it could have done to stop the invasion. Uh, they, as Chris Hedges says, uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, he says it was unjustifiable, but um, predictable, and it was avoidable. And we've seen since the beginning of the war, we've seen the United States try to, uh, you know, the West and the United States try to stop peace negotiations. 
So where does hegemony fit into that? Well, this goes into, I mean, this goes way back in terms of the U.S. and what they've really been doing since the end of World War II. Or even if you take it back to World War I, it's similar to things the British were doing. A part of the reason World War I happens is because uh, the admiralty of uh, you know the, the British Navy, and you've got Winston Churchill, he's in a position of power there, and they make the decision that they're going to have to go for oil and that they're going to refit the entire British Navy to run on oil because it's more efficient. And the big oil, there's not much oil in Britain. There's a lot of coal, and that helped them earlier in industrialization, but not in the age of oil. Now, there is a lot of oil in the Middle East, and Germany is building a railroad that goes all the way from Berlin to Baghdad. And this is in the years before World War I. And this would have been a huge threat to uh, the British Empire. And uh, people, more and more historians nowadays, are recognizing that this was actually an underlying cause of World War I, that this whole Anglo-Atlanticist uh, imperialism, which the U.S. has inherited, that it's been really preoccupied with the idea of Germany, uh, as a, and especially Germany combined with Middle Eastern uh, oil resources and with Russian raw materials, that if they ever became allied, that that would be a real countervailing power against the U.S. and before that against Britain. So this was uh, a part of World War One, and then in and then after World War One, you know, you have the Balfour Declaration, which gets into pipelines and other issues. I mean, this is an underlying part of of why Israel gets established. So people would think about this as maybe politically active. Uh, Jewish people who, you know, who are Zionists and want this homeland in the area. But there were elements of the British establishment that made all sorts of plans and schemes to uh, after the Ottoman Empire got gets broken up. And a lot of it has to do with pipelines and controlling that Middle Eastern oil. Um, but it, and this there's also this fear of Germany as allying with Russia, especially as the Great Depression hit. And this was a huge concern of theirs. This is why they back somebody like Hitler, who is a, a kind of a who's, well, kind of who is a lunatic, but he has as his main redeeming quality the fact that he it will kill all the communists. And so he's backed by uh, Anglo-American elites, you know, Tory elites, and so on, and people like John Foster Dulles, who helped to broker bond sales on the international market, which allowed for Germany to rearm. And the whole idea is to create a uh, put a regime in there that will not allow the socialists to take over. So they have the Reichstag fire and they blame it on a communist, even though it was most likely the Nazis that did this. Uh, and they eventually attack Russia. The, they were called the anti common turn pack. That's the name of the Axis powers, the, you know, Italy, Germany, and Japan. It's the anti common turn, mm -hmm. anti communist international. And uh, it, the idea was to set them up like, to attack Russia. Or the Soviet Union. Now, after World War II, you had Europe, which was economically in bad shape. Russia was devastated. Even though they won, they lost 27 million people. They didn't want Eastern Europe to be... The Russians, the Soviets didn't want Eastern Europe to be uh, part of a block that only they controlled. They actually thought they would trade with Western Europe and they could have some you know, good relations with them. It's really the U.S. who decides that uh, they can't allow the Eastern Europe, the, the communist countries to trade with the West. They, they do this because they're really afraid of neutrality. They're not afraid the Soviets are going to invade. They're afraid of neutrality and that there would be trade between Europe and Russia, just like today with the Nord Stream. And so they have this document, NSC 68, which describes the dollar gap and all this prob these problems of trading uh, with the, the Russians and the problems that the Europeans are going to have. And the way they get around that is to create the military industrial complex to have a lot of money and the Marshall Plan, keeping money flowing the right way, but also shutting off trade between Europe and Russia. And because the, they just need that to, to create this capitalist world that they wanted. And that's what they've had since the end of World War II is the U.S. as the center of gravity with capital and trade going across the, the Pacific and the Atlantic Ocean both uh, and the U.S. to maintain this position of global dominance. And this has been since the end of uh, in the 21st century, the end of the Cold War, they've been going further and further east. So going into former NATO, uh, former Soviet bloc countries with the, ex the expansion of NATO, the whole global war on terror and the Arab Spring Wars afterwards, if you look at them, these are in the same vein. They're really 
trying to maintain hegemony over that pivotal area between Europe and the former Soviet dominated sphere of influence and control the Middle East as well. And this is all really about the U.S. attempting to manage geopolitics around the world. And they have they eventually did so much in Ukraine that and uh, with that, it was uh, perceived as a threat by the Russians, which it was. I'm not going to say you can justify the invasion, but what the U.S. was doing in Ukraine with the Maidan coup, which was one of the most obvious CIA coups ever, uh, and then not allowing mints to take to happen and to have this this war, this this attack on the Donbas, this is all to um, try to damage Russia. That was the reason the U.S. put so much emphasis on Ukraine in the first place was because. It was perceived as an area of Russian vulnerability. Zbigniew Brzezinski, in his book, The Grand Chessboard, which was commissioned by the Council on Foreign Relations, the same group that planned the U.S. War, uh, global empire during World War II, before it even had won the war, uh, that Brzezinski was talking about Ukraine all the way back then in the, in the mid-90s. And it's so straightforward to understand as the, the, why the U.S. is there. The U.S. is not especially concerned about democracy really anywhere when it comes down to it. Ne definitely not in Ukraine. It's The significance of Ukraine is that it is geopolitically extremely important to Russia. It's almost like as important as, say, the entire like east coast of the United States. It, it's really, you can't quite put it into an easy analogy, but it's the warm water port that connects to the Mediterranean and thus to, uh, you know, point south for Russia. And it's how it's a, it was a part of how they were able to save the Syrian government when the U.S. was trying to take that, that government down. So it's just enormously important and very provocative. And it kind of supersedes questions of justice or righteousness or international law, because for one thing, the U.S. violated international law by overthrowing the government in the first place in 2014, but also Existential security is just the, the U.S. ignores international law all the time over things that are way less threatening than what Ukraine represents to Russia. So uh, people just need to understand how these things work in historical context. But most of our education and media, it does just the opposite. Right. That it's there to make. Ooh, we lost you. Uh Oh, the deep state inter intervening. OK, are you there? You froze for a second. I'm here. Okay, great. So we're going to get into the Nord Stream pipeline. We're going to get into the weaponization of the term conspiracy theory. Uh, but before we go into that, wanted to ask you some more nerdy questions. Uh, what is the tripartite state? So I wrote about the tripartite state first in 2015, and it's a theoretical construct to try to explain the deep state, which by 2015 wasn't, didn't, hadn't been turned into, hadn't been Trumpified, it hadn't been given right. that, that terrible taint uh, uh, with as being associated with Donald Trump, and it, it's a, it builds on ideas of the dual state, which would be you know two, a two part thing, which was the idea of a security state and a democratic state, right? Uh, the security state would be these security bureaucracies like the military, the FBI, CIA, and then the, the democratic state is the part they teach you about in, in high school civic classes, you know, elections and Congress and the president and all that. But it, neither of those ac accounts, the, the idea of a dual state is actually a critique of democracy and it says, hey, these security state institutions are very powerful and kind of undemocratic and secretive and potentially lawless. We should look at them more. The tripartite state complicates it even further because it, it's a way of looking at a, a different kind of power and how it is institutionalized in the way we are governed. So I'm really happy you have me on uh, on this Valentine's Day, Katie, because yeah. you're I think you're you're the best. So uh, oh, thanks for thanks. having me on. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks so much for coming. I've been wanting to have you on for so long. Um, and uh, guys, we're gonna. If you were watching live, you're so in luck because you get to hear this full Aaron Good interview. Uh, if you're watching this later and you want to see the full Aaron Good interview, which is really good and gets pretty spicy, then go to patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. Also, that's where you'll be able to see the interview I do with Brianna Joy Gray. And before we leave, we're just going to play a clip of that Brianna Joy Gray interview, which you can see uh, the rest of at Patreon. Bree, I want to have you on to talk about Rogan Gate. That's the name I'm giving it. Let's see if it sticks. 
<laughs> but this is a story that has to do with Ilan Omar, and it uh, raises a lot of issues that are near and dear to my heart, and I think yours too. So let me just set this up for people. So as most people probably know, earlier this month, Kevin McCarthy stripped Omar from her seat on the House Foreign Affairs Committee. And this goes back to a controversy that happened in 2019 when Omar was smeared as an anti-Semite over comments she made about the Israel lobby. Um, let's show this tweet. What happened was in 2019, Glenn Greenwald tweets, GOP leader Kevin McCarthy threatens punishment of Ilan, GOP leader Kevin McCarthy threatens punishment for Ilan and Rashida Tlaib over their criticisms of Israel. It's stunning how much time U.S. political leaders spend defending a foreign nation, even if it means attacking free speech rights of Americans. And then Ilan Omar quote tweets this and says it's all about the Benjamins, baby. Now, that's a reference to um, money because Benjamins refers to Benjamin Franklin, who graces the face of the um, $100 bill. It was also made famous in a, in a song, in case people didn't already know that term. And what happened next was that she was accused of being an anti-Semite. Um, and just to unpack what she was saying, like uh, she was saying here that money plays a role in politics, especially when it comes to Israel. What a concept. I know, right? <laughs> that's, that's just the facts. It does. Yeah. And saying that Israel, the Israel lobby, uh, Saying that there's an Israel lobby is not anti-Semitic because there is an Israel lobby. It's called APAC. I mean, there are a couple of different forms of it, but one, the American Israeli Political Action Committee is obviously, literally just a lobbyist for Israel. And uh, like any other lobby, they use money to try to sway politicians and politics. And of course, the other thing is that when she's talking about the Benjamins, she's talking about the effect that that has on Kevin McCarthy, who's, in case you couldn't tell, is not Jewish. Um, so not only was she smeared as an anti-Semite, but uh, the House passed a resolution to condemn, quote, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, racism, and other forms of bigotry in 2019. It didn't name her by name, but it was clear that that's what it was about. And we could do a whole other segment on how bad the Democrats were on this issue because they were, I mean, basically as bad as the Republicans on this issue. Uh, now, this time they did not vote to, to remove her, but Akela Lacey actually has a great piece of The Intercept laying out how they, in many ways, paved the path for, for this to happen. So I was actually one of the people who defended Ilan Omar because something that really bothers me is when people conflate criticism of Israel with anti-Semitism, and they're really, really, really different. And a lot of us on the left and a lot of us critics of Israel spend a lot of time trying to delink those things. And I mean, we can get into a whole discussion about how uh, it's anti-Semitic to suggest all Jews support Israel because that's a, an anti-Semitic trope that goes back to the dual loyalty, uh, the idea that like American Jews are always going to be loyal to Israel as opposed to the United States. The truth is like Jews run the gamut on where they stand with Israel. There's been a whole history of anti-Zionism among Jews. There are religious Jews who are anti-Zionist. There are secular Jews who are anti-Zionist. So let's, I'm just going to play a little clip of myself if I, if I do, do, so, do so myself. Uh, appearing in the lion's den on Laura Ingram show on Fox defending Ilan Omar. Katie, you say that uh, Omar's comments are both not anti-Semitic and you, you didn't have a problem, I imagine, with the first comments. No, I and mean, I have a problem the apology with was her fine. as an anti-Semite. She said something. This is how anti-Semitic it was, apparently. She said something that Thomas Friedman, major supporter of Israel, has said. Thomas Friedman said an applause that Bibi Netanyahu received was paid for by the Israel lobby. There's nothing anti-Semitic in there. What is anti-Semitic, though, if you want to talk about anti-Semitic tropes and playing into those, is what Kevin McCarthy, who, along with Donald Trump, is going after Omar, what he said in a tweet that he deleted, Soros and Bloomberg and Steyer were buying the election. Now, that is an anti-Semitic trope that he definitely played okay. into. He deleted the tweet, okay, but he so never apologized. Schumer has said things that are very Islamophobic, for instance, and no one asked him to apologize. There's this double standard. But no pattern. You see no oh, pattern no, there is, there's among a pattern some of these newer Congresswomen out, speak out against who seem Israel, to equate money you're with equated Jews. with anti-Semitism. Chuck Schumer, no. for instance, said that, that there's no peace in the Middle East because well, Palestinians uh, uh, don't follow okay, so Katie. Of course, we say it's our land. The Torah says it, but they don't believe in the Torah. They do believe so, in the Torah because they believe in Judaism. The, reason the there Old is Testament. Not peace. That's another thing. The, the reason why there is a state of Israel is because the Jewish people 
were almost exterminated from the face of the globe, and they did not have a sanctuary place they could go to have their own state. There wasn't a state for Jews to be able to call their own. I know, and by the I way, it's there. It's the there. And, and by the way, it's there. And it's their lands. We don't have to agree with absolutely every well, decision their yeah. government makes, but it is wrong to attack them as a people. Well, no one attacked them as a people, That's, luckily. I We're just saw that tweet. AIPAC. I'm a Jew. I'm a person. No one attacked me because I don't support AIPAC. It, Millions of Jews this, don't support APAC, and that's why there are all these but alternatives. But this is the problem. Because let, let Jews me, like me are really tired of having APAC, which is a very small but very powerful elite minority representation of Jews. It's very tiresome to have them speak, claim to speak for all Jews and conflate Jewish this, identity with unquestioning support of Israel, which is this an is the problem yeah. in itself. This, let me just say this, Lord. This is the, yeah. this is the big right. dynamic. It would be nice if Donald Trump had actually this, condemned the people in Charlottesville. This, and this you, is Matt, the you work in this communication, If right? I could please just oh answer. Why didn't he this is the dynamic. Let's stay. Let's let's okay. stay. Okay, guys, 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 I got to tell you, guys, 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 stop. Jews stop. In this statement. All right. So that was a good time, and um, so th there you can tell I, I as well as many others, really try to do a lot of work to to show that it's not anti-Semitic to be critical of Israel, right? Okay. So now, let's watch what happened when this all about the Benjamins moment was brought up during a conversation between Crystal Ball and Joe Rogan. I just saw like Nancy Pelosi is endorsing Adam Schiff for California Senate. When you read through the way that man lied to the American public through all of Russiagate, you're like, yeah, he should be, he should be like in prison for perjury, not being bolstered mm -hmm. by one of the po most powerful women in the country. Do you for see United him set, Senate. sitting next to Ilian Omar where she's, uh, she's apologizing for talking about it's all about the Benjamins, yeah. which is just about money. She's, she's talking right. about she money. She shouldn't have apologized. She, that I mean, was I'll not, go ahead That's not an anti-Semitic statement. I don't think that is. It's about Benjamins or money. You know, the, the idea that Jewish people are not into money is ridiculous. Listen. That's like saying uh, Italians aren't into pizza. It's fucking <laughs> I mean, stupid. Listen. It's I, fucking stupid. I understand that the way she phrased it, like she could have phrased it a different way. So then Crystal, to her credit, totally, she redirects the conversation back to the role of money in politics, making it clear that what Ilan Omar said was not anti-Semitic. The problem is what Joe Rogan said was anti-Semitic. I mean, I'm not saying he's an anti-Semite, but the joke, it's not like, you don't have to break this down. It's literally... Jews like money. And it really bothered me for a couple reasons. One is because he claims to be def with defenders, you know, with friends like these who needs enemies, right? Like with defenders like these, who needs defenders? Like this was great for people who hate Ilan Omar because they could just point to this actual anti-Semitic joke and, and say, look at the people who are defending her. But also he, that's not what she was saying. She wasn't saying Jews love the Benjamins. She was saying yes. American politicians are bought and paid for, which they are. Yeah. I think that's part of why, and I wonder how you feel about this, Katie. I sort of agree with Crystal's when Crystal when she says she shouldn't have apologized for the all about the Benjamin tweet. Because in apologizing, there's an argument that she validated the perception that what she was saying was, you know, Jews like money. Right. Instead of saying, I won't apologize for saying that a lobbying group lobbies. Sure. <laughs> right. You know, and I don't know. I mean, it's hard to know in the moment at a time. And I'm sure when she was under all that pressure, it felt like the easiest thing to do. But we've seen time and time again, if you give an inch, they'll take a mile. And I hate to be taking too many lessons from Donald Trump in that era. But one thing that he demonstrated is that there's a certain kind of Teflon Don right. ability to weather crises and controversies when you don't apologize. Nothing really sticks if you don't admit to wrongdoing. And obviously there was plenty that he did that was legitimately wrongdoing. But in this case, for Ilhan Omar to have validated that there was anything wrong with that tweet. Now, I don't remember. Maybe there was some other stuff. There was other, other stuff that she said. She that should have apologized for. I don't actually think she should have apologized for any of them. She talked about loyalty, but um, loyalty to another country. But again, she wasn't talking I mean, the irony is most Zionists are not Jewish. Like we live in a country where most Zionists are Christian Zionists. Mm. Um, what's interesting, though, about what she was saying, if you wanted to, to link this with a stereotype, it's not that Jews love money. It's that Jews are marionettes or puppeteers who use money and control the world. Like that's a stereotype. Mm. You know what I mean? Like he didn't mm -hmm. even get the stereotype right. It wasn't about Jews loving money because Kevin McCarthy isn't Jewish. Maybe if the person who had been doing Israel's bidding was Jewish, you could say that. But 
it was just such a lazy, sloppy thing for Rogan to do. And it was, it was just really, yeah. and then, you know, this is interesting because I feel like we kind of talked about this the other day. So there's a whole lot more where that comes from. That's just a teaser. Thank you, Brad, for editing together that clip. Um, so to see the rest of that, go to patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. Again, that's patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. And I thank everyone who's a Patreon supporter. And again, this is because we need to uh, put money into the show. Nobody's getting rich off of this. Um, we would love to provide everything for free. That's why we provide a weekly show where, where things are free. And um, we just offer this extra content. So again, that's patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. And thank you so much to Susan Abuhawa. Thank you so much to Aaron Good. And we will see you on uh, Colin. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Brad. Thanks, Tyler. Thanks, Phantom Asfanta. Okay, I'm done.